All right, this is Marty Wilson. It's the 24th of March, 2022. I'm sitting in the Monroe County Historical Association with Mr. Charles Smith and his daughter, Julie smith Golan. And Amy's here and Tanya's here as well. And we're here to talk with Mr. Smith about his life in Monroe County. So, uh, Charles, why don't you tell us where and when you were born and who your parents were? I was born in the Palmerton Hospital in uh, 1936 and my parents were Earl Smith from Kunkeltown and Susan Snyder Smith from Jonas. Um, and now where do we go? Well, the, your daughter mentioned your grandparents. Yeah, my grandparents. On my mother's side was uh, John Snyder who owned the Jonas Hotel and the farms and the woodlands around there. And uh, a very enterprising and engineering man. He uh, had the hotel, he had rooms, he had the bar, he had the dining room where they cooked for, for people on weekends. And they, he had a, a barn and a sawmill across the road and a blacksmith shop across the road and a feed grinding mill across the road. And all of these were run by water power, which he harnessed from the reservoir up the hill, up on the mountain from where the, the hotel was. And so they had electric lights in the buildings before there were, was electricity in, uh, in, in this part of Monroe County. They did it with a dynamo, which was sitting in a, a running water stream that ran under the parts of the building. I don't know exactly how they did it. I can, I can envision how they ran. It was an annealed hammered iron shaft that ran probably realistically 50 yards from where it started in the mill race. Did the mill, did the, did the uh, uh, blower for the blacksmith shop, did the sawmill, and then, then a shaft ran out of the ground and across the pond, and I don't know how, I guess it ran under the dirt road, I'm not sure, I don't remember that, into the house where it uh, ran the dynamo, which <coughs> produced the electric lights, ran outside the house, above ground, ran up to the barn where it powered the, the uh, big hay forks for lifting. The hay, uh, uh, hay which was loaded loose in a wagon. And we'd come up with it, with a team or with a tractor and plunge these, this big hay fork into it it would take a part of the load off and would run that was all run by water power and a shaft. And we're talking late 19th century here? Mm, yes, late 19th century. I know the hotel, what they called the new hotel, was built around 1900. I believe that some of the outbuildings were built before then, but we're talking about that time. Okay. time. The roads were dirt, of course. Did yeah. your grandfather design this? I don't know who designed it. I don't know who designed it, and I don't know who built it for him. I have no knowledge of that. I have a, a cousin who still lives on the part of the farm below that, where she was raised by her father, my uncle. My mother was one of 10 children. So there were five girls and then there were five boys. And my uncle, Ralph, who lived on the part of the farm below, had a house that was built in the 20s or the early 30s. And there he raised uh, my cousin Linda. Now she's still living there. So she's the one who should know a lot about the details. I just have little kids' imagination memories. So it was still running when you, you actually saw it? 
Oh yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, my family then was in either Kunkle Town or Jonas, and it was common on on a Sunday that after we ate Sunday dinner, we'd take a ride and go to one or the other and alternate them. So one Sunday we'd be in Kunkle Town, one Sunday we'd be up in Jonah. And um, I spent time there in the summer when my mother would go up to help her, her mother. Uh, they would house clean the whole hotel twice a year. And they no longer, when I was around, they never rented to anybody, that was all over. So that was all in the, probably the first 25, 30 years of the century, of the, of the 20th century. And then after that, just to be clear, the, the hotel shut down, or a family that did it, or? Well, uh, my grandfather died in 1948, and the hotel and, and a large part of the farm were sold. Um, so it just stopped, but the last years of his life, there was nothing going on because he, he was unwell and uh, everybody was gone. All the children were grown up and gone. The youngest child was born in 1912. The oldest was born around 1890 something. And as I said, there were five girls, one, two, three, four, five. He must have wanted to blow his brains out with three, 400 acres of property to deal with and no boys to help him. And then after that came one, two, three, four, five boys. And uh, my mom always said she was the fifth girl, the youngest girl. So her older sisters were off having boyfriends and getting married and running away from home as fast as they could. So she was stuck helping to raise these five boys. Uh, that's the reason she only had one herself, I think. Um, she'd had enough of it. But we had many good times. I have a, a cousin, Jay, who lives out in Michigan, and I think in Ann Arbor, I'm not sure, who spent a lot of time there because he was raised in Kresgeville and he would go up and work on the farm a lot when he was a boy growing up. I would be there on, on weekends and I would be there in the summer sometimes. Uh, so I had a taste of it, but I'm not not an expert on the, on the history of those things exactly. As I say, I was only a little kid. Yeah. So you remember guests in the hotel as a kid? Yeah. Well, it, it wasn't a hotel anymore then. It was just Grandpa's place where you went and stayed, and you had a room upstairs, and you went to it, and your mom had a room upstairs. If you were there, that's the way it worked. Yeah. And sometimes there'd be more than than two or three of his cousins all at one time because they would get together big family gatherings. <clears throat> Christmas, Easter. My grandfather loved to uh, crack eggs. You know what I mean by cracking eggs? Hard-boiled eggs. One person gets to hold it, the other person gets to try and crack it. And you want to use the pointy tip, not the blunt tip, because the blunt tip will break right away. The pointy tip, then, then you'd win the person's egg. My grandfather didn't tell anybody, but he had a wooden egg, so he, he won a lot of eggs. <laughs> that way. He won a lot of eggs that way. He also, uh, he came from a family of, I'm not, five or six or seven. I'm not sure exactly. And all Monroe County residents. Yeah, from places like the Kettle and so forth and so on. Huh. Uh, and he had a, a bachelor brother. I believe this man was the youngest of, of the kids in that Snyder side in the generation beyond. And he always lived there, never married, had a room, stayed with his brother and his sister-in-law there, and he took care of the bar. They had, they had a bar which ran for a long time, till, till 48, till they sold the property. And uh, 
several things I remember was he, he mumbled a great deal, so he was kind of hard to understand. Besides, he was talking in Pennsylvania Dutch most of the time, which I could understand pretty well as a young person. Never could speak, never, never was challenged to talk in, in the dialect. But I used to sit in the corner of the bar and listen as the workmen came in after work from wherever they were. One of the big employers was a man by the name of Rob Getz, who had big potato fields up on, up up, further up 534, going up toward Albrightsville. And these guys were unmistakable because when they came in, their trucks were green and their, their clothing was green from the Paris green that they sprayed on the potato plants to kill the potato bugs. Mm -hmm. I often wondered if it really, you know, affect, I don't think they wore masks. So were they affected? Were they harmed? I don't know. Yeah. And they would come in and they would drink their beer or whatever. My uncle Charlie, that was his name, he would, he would run the bar. And he didn't say much, but he was pretty good because he caught me stealing candy bars from behind the bar one time. <laughs> Put me up for that. Uh, that was, was one of the things that happened. There's lots of stories. There's lots of stories. Yeah. What, what about your dad? Where's your dad? Where was my dad? He was from Kunkeltown. And uh, he was born in 1901. Okay. My mother was born in 1899. Your grandfather went to the hotel as your mom's. Yeah, that's gotcha. my mom's dad. Gotcha. Right. My father's dad was a carpenter cabinet maker from Kunkeltown. Had been trained in Bethlehem. Never learned to drive a car. Never learned to drive a car. Never learned to drive a car. Neither did my mother a generation later. She never learned to drive a car. And uh, the family in Kunkeltown my grandmother. I mean, the, one of the things that as a kid you really loved about these families, the women were such good cooks and bakers. They really had good food. Now in Kunkeltown, they lived about halfway up the hill on the road out of Kunkeltown that winds up in Smith Gap. There was a, this is a little digression, but you guys, you, you take what you want. Uh, along about the turn of the century, as the New Jersey Zinc Company was starting to develop down in the Gap, in Lehigh Gap, some of the smart money guys, big money guys from New York City, whose names I can't tell you, I would, I would get them wrong if I did they found that there was a pretty pure clay deposit along the Chestnut Ridge. So they decided they were gonna build what was called the Chestnut Ridge White Brick Company. And they did. And they made a wonderful hard brick that was used in building. And you can still find this some places like Palmerton, some places like Philadelphia, maybe in Allentown buildings that were built by this. So they ran a, ran a railroad spur from Palmerton up to Kunkeltown. They called it the Chestnut Ridge Railroad. And uh, there down in the hollow behind my grandfather's place, they built this, uh, this factory. And at one time I knew those plans very, very well because my grandfather worked on them. They also built a station in Kunkeltown, which I think probably still exists. And across the road they had a, a loading platform where uh, Mr. Barley had a feed and grain mill and a loading platform. And they would bring the clay down from the Chestnut Ridge in trucks. They had a way of coming down, reversing and backing onto this and dumping it into gondola cars, not the higher coal cars, but the lower gondola cars. 
and then they would take it off. Well, in the course of events, they built this very fancy brick lodge just below my mother's, or just below my grandmother's place. And they had built uh, wagon, wagon sheds and they had built a tennis court a whole bunch of stuff, and it fell into disrepair because they went out of business. They couldn't make money making work. But that stood there for a long time. A long time. It's gone now? The building? The building? I'm not sure. I don't know if it's gone or not. It was quite a building. And at one time, after everything was over, as far as the New York fellows were concerned, the railroad still continued. But not the brick, not the brick forming business, not the brick roasting business, and, and not the clay being taken off to other places. Dad, didn't we just find the drawings for that? For one of the buildings we did, yeah. Mm -hmm. When that I was, was a kid in high building. school, there was oh, enough information yeah. around, and the ruins of the buildings down in the hall still exist. I remember when they blasted the the uh, the chimneys. To bring them down because they were unsafe. But I had as a ninth grade project drawn out the plans for the whole operation as existed. When they would bring it, bring it down and then take it in and then fire the bricks. They were still making the bricks there then. Do you remember the years when it started, when it ended? That kind of thing. No, I it mean, doesn't matter. Uh, the zinc company started in operation about 1898. Um, it took years. They built what was called their west plant first and then followed it with their east plant. And this operation used a railroad spur that uh, the Chestnut Ridge Railroad was about a nine mile railroad. And I think it was built probably in the late 19th century or early 20th century. And uh, My father graduated high school in 1919. For his entire career in high school, when he went to Palmerton, he had to go to Palmerton for high school. They went on the train. The train went down, took men to work at the zinc company in the morning, brought them back in the afternoon. Mm -hmm. So we can say that, were they still making bricks in 1919? I'm not sure. I'm not sure if they were or not but the railroad was still in operation and uh, a lot of the buildings were still there. Um, hmm. Shall we talk about your schooling? You know, did, where did you go to elementary school? My, my school years through high school, kindergarten through high school were all in poverty. Mm -hmm. First two years of my life were lived with my grandmother and grandfather Smith in Kunkel. But then my dad had built a house in Palmerton. We moved there in 1938. I was going to be two because I was born in December. Unfortunate timing. You never got a good batch of Christmas presents when your when your birthday is December 29. Forget it. Yeah, right, forget it. You had a nice Christmas. That was the story, you know. <laughs> Don't want to spoil the little guy, you know. Anyway, um, that was my schooling. Kindergarten, elementary school, high school in Palmer. Yep. And when you graduated from high school, did you have a career path? Yes. I went to Franklin and Marshall College. And then after that... Were you the first in your family to go to college? My dad had gone for a semester and then didn't go anymore. And I never found out whether it's because he wasn't happy or whether there wasn't the money. I'm not sure. I mean, when he went, it probably cost $250 a semester, if that. Mm -hmm. But for a carpenter, before the union, before Social Security, before any of that. That was a lot of money. 
my grandfather used to work for 75 cents a day. He worked part-time. My grandfather, Smith, worked for the zinc company for part of his career. Uh, and uh, they didn't pay very well. But as the old timers will tell you, if you, there were still any around, those guys who worked there never had a bad word to say about the Missouri Zinc Company. Because during the Depression, nobody got laid off. They had their time cut back, but nobody lost their job. And they all came back to it as things came back. So yeah. that was, you can't get the old guys, well, they're all dead now. You couldn't get the old guys to say a bad word about the Zinc Company. So you go off to Franklin and Marshall, did you say? Mm-hmm, I did. Yeah. Study what? what did you? Well, a lot of stuff. But I wound up going to medical school afterwards. University of Pennsylvania. Graduated from there in 64. And you had a career in medicine after that? Yeah. Uh, did my internship in Lancaster, my residency at Children's Hospital in Philadelphia. Then two years in the Air Force, because it was the mid-60s and the Vietnam War, Vietnam War was going strong. Then in 69, I actually came up here to Strasbourg for a year. Julie was about three, four. Five. And uh, we lived on 447, going across the hill from 209 to 447. And then after a year, I went back home. Built a practice, worked there, then went to Allentown, worked there. And I retired about uh, 10 years ago. I worked till I was 75. You were mm -hmm. a pediatrician? Yeah, yeah, pediatrician, good. Um, I got a good education in Palmerton and beyond. How unusual was it for your family, your siblings? Did you have other siblings? No, I was, was the only child, yeah. Uh, yeah, but for cousins, um, there were like two separate batches of cousins. Because the, the girls that were born in the 1890s, and then there was my batch, which came in the 30s. So there was a whole growing bunch. When I was 1942, 43, I was what, six, seven years old. I had a 20 year old cousin who was flying in the, uh, in the, in, in the Air Force for the Navy. Hmm. So there was this whole, it's like, it's like we knew each other, but we didn't, that, that, those two groups never played together. Yeah. So, yeah, I was the first one on my side of the family to really complete college, but I had cousins in my group and in the group before. They had all gone to college. Lehigh, Penn State. Um, and then with my group, uh, let's see. One became a... Uh, There was a Penn State branch somewhere down in the south middle part of the state, Mount Alto. And that's that's where he went to be trained. And uh, once he moved to uh, Michigan out there, he's worked for, I think, for the state on land development and stuff like that. I don't really know for sure. Mm -hmm. Well, you must have seen a lot of changes out there in the West End over the course of your life. Yeah, but a lot of them occurred after I was gone because remember now after after 48, it was just my uncle there. So I was around part of the time until 54 till I graduated from college, uh, high school. But after that, I wasn't around anymore doing other things. So that was true because my Kunkeltown family, they 
sold their place in 53 and moved into an apartment in Palmerton because my grandfather Smith was in his 80s at that point. My grandfather Snyder was a few years older than he, but he was still here at, until 48 when he died. Then my grandmother Snyder started moving from kid to kid to kid, you know, a month at a time, six weeks at a time, whatever. Not a very nice thing to have happen to you. I think she died about 1955 or 56. So after, your, your practice was out there before you moved here. I mean, you, live, you still live out there, I assume, right? I live in Allentown. Oh, you live in Allentown. Right? Yeah. So when's the last time you lived in Kunkeltown? Oh, Kunkeltown. Or the I whole did. West End. I mean, yeah, I well, I, you know, as a, as a permanent living place, my grandfather, Snyder, never. I never lived permanently there. It was always as a kid being schlepped around by my parents to visit people. And Kunkeltown, of course, everything was done after 53. It was gone. That was my junior year in high school. So once they moved into the apartment in Palmerton, I would see them, but not to stay, never stayed there. When you say your parents were schlepping you around? Visiting, visiting. But it wasn't a permanent thing like you were describing the woman who had to live with kids every... No, no, it wasn't this, anything is, like that. This, was, this was familial responsibility, I suppose, to go and visit on a Sunday. Okay. One place or the all right, well, we came to talk about the Jonas Hotel. Did we cover everything you wanted to say about the Jonas Hotel? No, I don't think so. Let's see. It was interesting being there as a kid because, as I said, they made their own electricity. But it was a very dim electricity. It wasn't bright like, like we have today. PPNL hadn't come up this way. As a matter of fact, my father as a young man in his 20s helped get PP&L to Elder Township over in the Kunkeltown area. And they, they had to get like a groundswell of, of interest in, in show, which he was involved in doing. But the dim lights went off whenever my Uncle Charlie decided it was time to go to bed. Then he would go down into the shandy where the dynamo was running in the water and throw the switch and everything would get dark. And then you lit a candle to go around. It was like, it was like you were living with George Washington's family or something, you know. It, it, was, it was really weird. I mean, we found it kind of interesting, I guess. But uh, they, they were very frugal. They were very frugal people. I think that's how my... Grandfather Snyder was able to accumulate what he accumulated. He was a county commissioner. He was responsible for uh, the fire protection such as it was, which was hardly non-existent out in the West End. But he had a hydrant on his property that tapped into his water supply. and. Uh, he started an insurance company. They, they developed something called the Farmers Mutual Insurance Company of Monroe County, where they would collect a yearly subscription, subscription from the local farmers, and then they would agree to indemnify them if they had a loss. And that continued as the Monroe Mutual later on, and then uh, subsequently probably was bought by one or the other. There were a lot of mutual insurance companies around. Commencing, Moon, Emmaus Mutual, Gosh and Outman. There were a lot of these mutual insurance companies before there was really good fire protection. So my grandfather was involved with that. And I was trying to think of the name. There used to be a, a hotel on the Main Street, on the what I would call the south side of the Main Street, kind of catacombed across from the Indian Queen, and I can't remember the name of it. And I think there's a building still there, but it's certainly not a hotel. Not the American House, you know. American House, that probably was it. Yeah. 
and our, my grandfather and his cronies who were involved in this insurance operation, every 1st of January, they would gather in the hotel and have their annual meeting and conduct their business. And my dad was involved in that a little bit, so I would get dragged along. And I would get to sit in the lobby and listen to the parrot. They had a parrot who was not a friendly parrot. He was not a nice parrot at all. Why do you but, say that? Well, he would bite you if you tried to approach him. He was, he was not loose. He was, you know, he was loose but contained. Uh -huh. And he would talk. I don't remember whether he talked gibberish or whether he talked English or whether he just swore. I'm not, I'm not sure. I'm not sure about that. But, and that's where the bus used to stop. The, the March bus and the Edwards Lakes to Sea used to stop there at that hotel. And I'm glad you remembered the name of it, the American House, because I didn't. I don't think I ever ate a meal there. What was it like coming into Strasbourg from the West End? Was it a big deal or not? Well, by that time I was living in Palmerton. I was five or older when we come into Strasbourg. Sometimes I would come in with my grandfather. There was a soda company here. I don't remember the name of it. He would go and pick up the soft drinks to load behind the bar. Mm -hmm. And it was, a, it was a town. It wasn't anything special in, in, the, in my mind other than as, as a kid, as you see. There was the Indian Queen Hotel. What else was there that was here? I never did get to go around too much because he would come in, load up, and then we would go back home, drive back to, uh, to Jonas. And uh, I remember one of the beers that they, that they had was F&S Sch Schmidt or something like that beer from up in the Wilkes-Barre area or someplace like this. He would, he would stock that and have that. Mm. But I was really, as I say, I'm really kind of peripheral to the real life of the West End of Monroe County. I mean, I was, I was in and out of it as a, almost as a visitor a lot, but never lived there, never went to school there. My cousin Jay, the one who lives in in Michigan, he grew up his entire life in, in, in Cresby. When, when there was a Cresby Law High School, he and his sister both graduated from there. And he probably would be a wealth of information far beyond what I have that I can, can tell about. Is there any any uh, remains of that electrical system that you talk about? I, I doubt it. When's the last time you were out there and saw the in years? The last time I was at the hotel, was in the, a family bought it from my grandfather, whose name was Held, H-E-L-D, and he was an automobile dealer from Kutztown. He had it for a while, and then some people by the name of Stauffer bought it and tried to run it, but it never was that successful as a place to go and eat. It just never was. And then, uh, in, in, eventually, my, daughter, my cousin Linda would know how it got sold to uh, the county or a veterans group or something like that. And I think they're using it now, if they're still using it, as a, a place for uh, veterans who largely have EPSDT to come and kind of try and get themselves together. Yeah. But hasn't been part of a, but there was a, a young boy, <coughs> young man, young boy, at 48, the son of Mr. Held, the dealer, whose name was Tom Held. And apparently my relatives just walked away from everything pictures, stuff, I don't know, because he has all of this, he had all of this, Tom Held. I believe he's younger than I am. I don't know if he's still alive or not. 
But he had a lot of the pictures. My cousin Linda would have a lot of the pictures. But the family just sort of walked away from it all huh. and left a lot of stuff behind. So that's how T Tom Held got his hands on it. And he has shown a great interest in it, preserving it. He'd be an interesting person for you guys to interview, as would my cousin Jay and my cousin Linda Snyder, who lives in the house below the, the Jonas Hotel. And did, did, you had a question, did I ask, answer your question? Yeah. Okay, all right. Well, that the, the big oven was behind there too, correct? Yes, that was part, part of the house. It was in the annex, and that got moved to the Gilbert Fairgrounds. Uh, mm -hmm maybe six or seven years ago. I don't remember exactly. Mm -hmm. It's a huge oven and sits over there now. And those of us who were, who could be gotten around were here for that. Um, when they dedicated it, I don't know if they still fire it up once in a while, do they? I think they run it during the West End Fair. Okay. I remember that going. To me it was all one house, but in reality it was in an annex behind the house itself. And it was in that same annex that the water came in, which in a, in a different edition ran this dynamo. But now if you talk to my cousin Linda, you talk to my cousin Jay, you might get an entirely different remembrance of all of these things, you know, because yeah. their kids remember this. Yeah. Did you go to the West End Fair? Yes. Mm -hmm. Yeah, as a matter of fact, I won prizes there one year. Oh, yeah? For, for stuff I grew, not for any animals. My cousin Jay, he, he would win prizes for chickens. He was, he was into chickens, and in his 4-H life, he uh, did chicken judging as, as a 4-H person. Well, I never did that, but I used to like to go and sit on the tractors. I would go and sit on the tractors. Imagine I was really driving them. And then when I did get to drive them, it was interesting because my uncle really needed help. And if I was there or Jay was there, Jay was there more than I, I would get to drive the tractor. And hay was mowed with a, with a sickle bar. And then it was raked up into rows, and dried and turned. And then it was loaded with what they call a hay loader, which was a thing that lifted it way up in the air and dropped it into a, an open wagon. Mm -hmm. And then once, once they went to bailing, they did much the same thing because they, my job was to drive the tractor. One day we were, we were loading bales. We wanted to put them in the pigsty up above the pigs. And, um, my uncle still had his cultivator bars under the tractor, sticking out each side. So me being wanting to be very nice and make it easy for them, I wanted to get the wagon in tight against the door up below so they wouldn't have to work for it. As a result, with those bars, I took the lower door clean off. <laughs> Just got in there. <laughs> so I don't think he paid to have me there that day. Now, how old was I? Mm. 12, 13, 14, you know. I started driving the tractor and my cousin Jay, too, I'm sure. When we were seven or eight years old, we were driving tractor. And Jay probably was working with the horses because they used to, before they got the tractor in the 40s, they did everything with horses. Ah, good, good memories. Interesting life you've led. Any other stories about the Jones Hotel or about your life in, in general? Well, we kids used to like to get in trouble because there was a back stairway to the second floor. Came up out of the bar area. And uh, we used to like to go up there, it was dark. And then, the, of course, the floor, you know, there wasn't much light to begin with. So we used to play around there, we kids, and we'd play hide and seek, different things like that. 
And my grandfather, when he was when this thing was really a young going enterprise, he had a little like a little what would you call it? You could call it a stand, but it really wasn't a stand. It was more like a a roofed over structure down near the stream where the stream came down, about a hundred yards up from the house. And that whole ground was covered with clamshells. When you went in there, you would walk on clamshells from all the clam bakes they used to have. Uh, uh, and they'd, they'd put the shells on the ground. Yeah. And uh, yeah. The other thing I liked, and I wish I had them now, that my grandfather would get these huge calendars from the Pennsylvania Railroad every year. These things would be worth a fortune now if you had them, that had their trains on it and their routes on it and stuff like that. And they would hang in the bar, and I was fascinated by these things. Fascinated by them. It was, it was wonderful stuff. Oh, sounds, sounds like you had an interesting life. It was an interesting life. It was not a not a very exciting life, but it was an interesting life. And uh, there were a couple of near near misses. Had an older cousin, Jay's older sister, who's passed away now. There was a huge sawdust pile out behind the sawmill. Huge. Sawdust, okay. And the kids were playing around. This is, I don't remember this. Because my cousin Jean was probably six years older than I was. She apparently went down through a hollow spot, down into the sawdust pile. And my dad saw her and was able to pull her out, help her get out. And my story is that in the early years when I was probably seven, they still cut their grain, went over it with something called a binder, which tied it into sheaves, and you would walk around, and whoever was helping you, you'd walk through the field and you'd stack these sheaves and make a, a, a rain top for it, and that's where it would dry, and then in a week or two, I don't remember how. You would go back around the field again, and now you would fork the sheaves onto a hay wagon and take them to wherever your thresher, or your threshing machine was. And in the barn at that time, which was a bank barn, the threshing floor had bays on either side, which were mow bays. So <clears throat> the threshing machine was sat in the, in the front part of the threshing floor, and they would bring the load in, and then they would hook the tractor's flywheel up to the wheels on the thresher, and that, that's how they would turn the thresher, okay? So they'd use the tractor to do that. When the load was empty, they'd take the belt off, take the tractor, the wagon, go back out and load up again. Well, I had a job to do because the threshing machine blew the straw into the mouths, to the one side or to the other side. And my job was between loads. My job was to climb up in there and stomp around as much as I could to get it all stomped down. So it wasn't just fly loose up there. Mm -hmm. And uh, one time they, they, they finished, they went back out, they were out getting another loot. I climbed into the mound to do my thing. It was getting pretty full at this time. I was up, almost up against the roof. And all of a sudden, phew, I went down in a hollow spot. All the way down to the, to the bottom floor. I couldn't get out. I was okay to breathe. I, it was, I had a hollow spot where I could breathe. I mean, it scared the heck out of me. But then I started, what am I gonna do? 
they're going to come in, they're going to hook up, they're going to make noise, and they're going to blow more stuff in on top of me. So I waited till I heard him come up with the load in the tractor, and I knew they had to stop the tractor to hook up the belt. So when it stopped, I started yelling like heck. And my uncle heard me, my one uncle heard me. He came, he started poking around with the handle of a pitchfork. And he found me and I grabbed hold of it. And he pulled me right out. So there I am, I'm out. And they said, well, why don't you go down to the house? So I went down to the house and my mom was working in the kitchen. And I told her what happened. She made me a plain cheese sandwich and then told me to go back. <laughs> you didn't get cut any slack in the Snyder family at all. You know? yeah. Yeah. Those are some of the stories. Well, they were all very interesting. But do, is there something we should have asked you about? How did, your, how did your parents meet? Did you know? Oh, yeah. How did they meet? Uh, they used to have dances on a weekend up here at the Jonas Hotel. And these dances, they would, they would be lucky if they had a fiddle player. And that's, that would be the music for the square dancing. Uh, my dad, they met, I think, When my mom was maybe 21, my dad was maybe 19 or 20, he was a couple of years younger than you. He could play the fiddle, so he was up here, probably somebody else was playing also, and they were playing at a dance, and my mom was working around. She was working kind of as a waitress, barmaid, whatever. And um, I guess they caught each other's eye or whatever. And, uh, and they, that went on. And, they fell in love and they got married in 1923. And uh, I think, I think my mother's sister was married to a guy from, was, was going to be married or to a guy from Kunkeltown. He had a Model T and he would bring my dad over. My dad would play and my uncle would be around there and stuff like this. Yeah. So that's, that's how they got together. Did they have weekly dances? I don't know how often it was. I doubt that if it was weekly, but but I don't really know. I was I was not even a thought at that point. <laughs> you came along a few years later. I did. That's yeah, twenty three. Twenty three to thirteen. First. Yeah. Thirteen years. Yeah. yeah. And I asked my dad one time, were you trying to or not to? <laughs> And and he said we weren't trying either way at all. It just happened that way. So, uh, I don't think my mom was unhappy about it because here she had had these five boys that she was kind of rearing. She probably was glad for a break for a while. But it must not have been too much fun living with her in-laws for 13 years. That would have been tough in Cocoa Town. Because that's where they were when they got married. They went over there living with my with the Smith grandparents, 13 years. And then you came along and then that's when they got a house? Is that what you're saying? Yeah, two years later huh. in Palmerton. And my dad worked for the zinc company for 35 or 40 years. Yeah. Well, Julie, do you have anything you want to add to this story? Oh, let me think. The only thing I think we would add is this, your cousin Linda was very integral in the creation of the Pocono Heritage Land Trust. She was on the board of that group. And I believe that part of the Jonas water area towards the top is sort of preserved now in a, in a nature preserve there. Which she was nice. involved in that. And she was involved in getting the, the, the let's call it the bake oven. Right. Oven moved, so, moved right. so she did a lot of work for that. Yeah. And I don't do know, you know if she's her? still on the. Linda. Yeah. Do you know her? I just know her name and 
Yeah. And how, how active she was to see yeah. that as integral to that. Yeah. She'd yeah. be a good person. Mm -hmm. She's somebody. To I'd bring her up. That might be the only way. I'd bring her up. Yeah. All right. Well, then. Do <laughs> Thank you. Well, on that note, we'll turn off the recording. But thanks very much. It was very interesting. Um, something you guys should learn about, too. I won't turn it off. <laughs> <laughs> well, this, is a little, this is just a thought that I had now. but At that time, primary school went to sixth grade. The instruction was in Pennsylvania, Germany. Then, if you were from the middle part of the West End, Gilbert, Effort, there were two private schools that went through eighth grade. Uh, the one was Gilbert Polytechnic, which was created and supervised by Reverend Smith, who was a 50-year pastor in, 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 in that Pleasant Valley area. And the other, I don't remember, but my mother went through sixth grade, then, then maybe a couple of years over there at Gilbert Polytechnic. That Gilbert area was, this guy was another important man in the area. Uh, and then there was the one that my dad went to, which was the other one, which was an effort. And he and the other boys like him who came from the Kunkeltown area used to take their bicycles on a Sunday and drive over there, and then they'd stay there till Friday, and then they'd drive their bicycles back home. So they had a room with women, who do that, who live their rooms out. And I don't know what that was like, but there's some, between there and Gilbert, there are some pretty achieved men who came out of this, this area of Monroe County. Hmm. Um, that says Kresge, being the name that comes to mind. Yeah. yeah. And uh, of course they've got that big mausoleum over there in the Gilbert Cemetery. Uh, I think he was older than my mother. I, I'm, I'm not sure. I believe he was, she was born in 1899. I imagine he might have been my grandfather's age. I'm not sure. But it was, it was quite an educational experience. This Reverend Frank Smith was his name. I don't know where he came from originally. But he came here, he stayed here for 50 years and he built the church and the school and things of that type. It really did a lot of good for this area. Um, I met him as a baby. I think he baptized, I'm not sure, no, he didn't baptize me. A man over at Kunkeltown baptized me. Um, but I was always impressed that out of this area came these there, and there were a couple more too whose names I can't remember. Anyway. You know, I was talking to somebody the other day that told me that Germans were discriminated against, especially during the war. Did you experience any of that? No, I never did. Nor do I, do I think my parents ever did. I doubt that my grandparents ever did. I mean, these two families had been here for, since 1730. Schmitz and Schneiders. Schneiders and Schmitz. The Schmitz came from, from Germany, from the Palatinate. The Schneiders, we always thought did too, but my youngest son found out that they, the Schneiders actually were from German-speaking Switzerland. Hmm. But they both wound up in what was then a, called Northampton County, out of which they broke Lehigh and Carbon and Burks and so forth. Uh, in Lynn Township, um, which is 
sort of across 309 going up into the mountain in western Lehigh and then quickly gets into eastern Berks. So that's where both these families located. And then the Smiths gradually worked their way up to the top of the Blue Mountain. The story was that the Germans threw them out of Germantown. The, uh, the, the Quakers threw them out of Germantown because they were too rowdy and drank too much. So I've always imagined that the best they could do was climb to the top of the Blue Mountain and then roll down into Smith County, <laughs> which is as far as they got. <laughs> The Snyders, I'm not as sure about how they made their way here. They eventually got up into the South Tamaqua area and then came back through somehow. But there they were, Kunkletown and Jonas. That's enough, isn't it? <laughs> <laughs> that was great. Well, thanks very much. I'm going to turn it off now. Go ahead. Turn that off. was good. Thanks very much. You're welcome.